Take out your Bibles and turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, page 1821. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 17. Our theme today is on living as children of God, living as children of the light. And here's how we're going to do this. We're going to divide this up by paragraph. You're going to begin with paragraph 1. I will follow with 2 and so forth. Okay? Page 1821, uh, chapter 4 of the letter to the Ephesians, verse 17. Everybody there? Go ahead, please. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. This is the word of our Lord. Now turn to Matthew chapter 15, page 1521. Matthew chapter 15, page 1521. Okay, and I want to warn you. You and I probably don't understand this in its full capacity. So today you need to think, put on your Jewish cap. Okay? And you need to think like a Jewish person 2,000 years ago. I know it's important, impossible. But I want you to think this way. Because what Jesus says here is a radical, revolutionizing understanding of something that was fundamental in his day. That all Jews thought. Alright? So you need to understand this. Okay? So give it your best shot. Some Pharisees, teachers of the law, came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? God said, Honor your father and mother. Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is now a gift devoted to God. He is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd together. 
listen and understand what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that's what makes him unclean. Disciples came to him and said, Do you know the Pharisees were offended when you, they heard this? Jesus answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, they both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Lord, explain to us this parable. Are you still so dull? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. These things make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immor immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands, that does not make him unclean. Turn back. We're going to go through the story here. Okay? These verses bring Jesus' harshest words against the Pharisees. Now, I want to give the Pharisees their credence. On the positive side, the Pharisees of Jesus' day were that sect of Judaism that were most intent on following the righteous will of God. They were what we would consider the really good guys from a moral perspective. They conscientiously endeavored to follow the will of God, and for that they were respected by most of the people, even the disciples of Jesus. They were committed to practice righteousness, okay? So they come to him now, and they come to test him. And they accuse him and his disciples by saying, why don't you follow tradition? Why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? Now, is that command found in the Bible? Yes? Anybody going to say yes? yes. Kathy, you want to say yes? yes? How many want to say no? Yeah, it's both and. <laughs> it is found in the scriptures, but a very narrow window. The priests, when they went into the Holy of Holies for the sacrifice, they were to wash their hands. But in Jesus' day, that command, confined to the priest, had now expanded to include everybody in Judaism, and it was thoroughly followed by most of the people. But the, the deal is, it doesn't come from the scriptures. You know where it comes from? The halakha, H-A-L-A-K-E. The halakha was the rules of conduct written by venerable rabbis collected over the years. And so one of the venerable rabbis said, before you wash, or before you eat, you should wash your hands. Okay? And it was followed by almost everyone, very common practice, because they thought if you didn't, you would be unclean. Okay, now what's the reason behind it? You germaphobes, what's the reason behind it? You're wrong. It had nothing to do with being sanitary. It, had, it was this was behind it. Let's say you went to the marketplace and you were out among the folks and you rubbed a guy. Are you a Gentile? Yeah, you're a Gentile. And you rubbed against a Gentile or touched him or you touched something he was selling in the marketplace. And if you sat down to eat and put food into your mouth, what would happen? You would get his uncleanness would be transferred into you, and you would be unclean, defiled. Now, in our culture, that's crazy, right? But in that culture, that's how most people thought. So you had to wash your hands before you ate, because just in case, you might have touched Bob. All right? And got not germs, but uncleanness. Doesn't that sound crazy? Okay? Now, if you look, at, follow along here, go to verse 7, or verse uh, 3, I guess. Jesus doesn't answer their question, does he? He answers it with a, another question. Here's Jesus' point. 
you guys deny the commands of God and you follow your traditions instead of following the clear commands of God. In other words, the commands of men nullify the commands of God. Here's the example. What commandment did it have to do with? Fourth, honor your father and your mother. So here was the deal. In Jewish thought, children were to provide for their parents in their old age. Okay, their working years were over. A child was responsible to honor their father and mother by providing for their physical needs. So here was the loophole. But it was okay if you, as a devout Jew, would make a vow that what you would give to your parents, you would dedicate to God and to the temple. And then you can go to mom and dad and say, you know, I'm sorry. I don't have any money for you because I gave it to God. <laughs> and here's the deal. Just because sinful human beings. Shows how we always find a loophole. Just because it was dedicated to God doesn't mean it was actually given to God. That's the deal behind the story. So Jesus dis responds with this greater wrong, okay? Verse 7, he calls them hypocrites. You know what a hypocrite is. That's someone who seems to be something they are not. We're all good at that, by the way. The older you get, the better you are. Correct? So then he quotes Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What commandment does that have to do with? Thank you, Rob. Number one. You shall have no other gods before me. You say you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. In other words, faith has to be genuine, has to be real. It can't just be surface, oh, I love God. And yet my heart doesn't really care what God has to say. That was a problem of the day. It's first commandment stuff. Human precepts do not substitute divine truth and commands. Now go to verse 10. We're going to come back to this later on. Jesus pulls them together and he says, now listen, pay attention. Here's the deal. This was a revolutionary principle went against everything people thought. It is not what comes into the man's mouth that makes him unclean. It is what comes out of the man that makes him unclean. And then, turn the page, Jesus then explains it more fully. Well, he talks about the Pharisees, and he's, notice he says to them, they're blind guides. Let them go. Don't even bother with them. They are, were not planted by God in God's garden. They were not planted. What they're doing is made for man, and God's going to pull it out. So let them go. Don't even bother. Then Jesus expands on this, and he says, Out of the heart proceeds what? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, slander. There's eight of them. In Mark's gospel, there's 13. And did you notice most of the commandments are covered there, right? Okay, so that's the deal. That's what Jesus' point is. And that brings us to part two of the sermon, which is the most important point of this. It is God's perspective on sin, its source, and our sad human condition. Sin, and I want you to think about sin is an interior problem, not an exterior problem. Sin is a problem of my very being. Out of the heart, out of who I am as a human being, comes the evil in words and deeds and actions. Okay? I think a lot of us think shallowly, shallow ideas of sin. How many of you have been to confession? Anybody ever go to confession as a kid in the, in the Catholic Church? Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Right? Good thing. I'm not making fun of it. But so often our confession is, well, I, I drove 20 miles over the speed limit, or I drank too much the other night, or I lusted after this man or this woman, or I did this. Okay? See, a lot of us think, well, sins are out there. Those are the stuff outside of me. Yeah, I do them. I sin periodically. But I'm basically a good person. Okay? And yeah, they're wrong, and I admit that. But that's not really who I am. Flip Wilson, remember Flip? He would say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> right? And that's a lot of our confession. It's very shallow. 
Real confession is, Father, this is who I really am. Out of my heart comes the evil I experience and I see. You see, sin isn't just a surface thing. It is an internal, interior problem I have and you have. Now, the world hates this. The world fights this completely. But God, if, you're, if you have no God, you can do whatever you want, okay? But God says, this is his perspective on who you are. And it's not a pretty picture, is it? It's not a pretty picture. Remember, uh, let me read this. One of the commentators said, the sinful heart is a cesspool filled with wicked considerations spewing out evil words and actions. Remember St. Paul. He wrote this, O wretched man that I am, the good I what? Want to do, I end up not doing, and the evil I hate, I end up doing. O wretched man that I am, who can help me? Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That here we have the fundamental thing we learn from this is what sin is. It isn't surface stuff. It's here. It's who I am, and it's who you are, and the world doesn't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to admit it. So here's the gospel for today. The all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ has not only paid for your sins out there, but it has bought you and redeemed you as a poor, sinful human being. We've got to understand that. I think sometimes we think grace, yeah, okay, it takes care of those things. No, grace is where in spite of your sinful nature, God now has what? Accepted you and made you his son or daughter. He's declared you holy even though sin still abounds, right? But God now has bought you with the price of his blood. He has now accepted you as his own dear child. I hope you understand that. So oftentimes, we, we just don't understand sin. We make it light. We make it, we make it light. And if sin is light, you know, then the gospel doesn't mean much. But when I understand my personal problem, and by the way, I've been thinking about this all week, and it isn't a pretty picture. <laughs> but when you understand that, grace is so much what? Sweeter. Because God doesn't take care of the surface stuff. He takes care of me, who I am, and the evil that lurks within and shows itself quite often. That's huge. That's huge. It is a complete acceptance of me through the sacrifice of Christ. Not just the frivolous sins, the little stuff I do wrong, but me. And when we understand that, grace means so much, okay? Part three, a couple of words of application. I want to go back to verse 12 where Jesus calls the folks together. He says, now listen to me. Pay attention. This principle by which you all live, that if you don't wash, you're going to be unclean defiled, is wrong. What do we learn from that? Well, this. We've got to be careful that just because we hear something in a religious context, oh, that it must be true. Just because somebody says something to you on television ministry, or if you hear words out of my mouth, that doesn't mean they're true. We need to learn to test the Holy Spirit. We need to discern what is correct and what is not. And I think sometimes we Christians are dim-witted. I hate to say it. We're not that bright. I've had people say to me, Pastor, you know, I heard on television this guy was saying to that, that must be true. No, not necessarily. It could be his idea. I'm going to give you some examples. Now, 500 years ago in Martin Luther's day, what was the dumb idea that was, that was generally accepted in Europe? 
You indulgences, thank you. You could actually pay money to the church in Rome, get a piece of paper, and get grandma out of purgatory. That's a dumb, sounded great to the folks of the day, but when you think about it, how dumb that is. Yet it was propagated, that's the way, that's, that's, that's the Bible. We had a reformation over that. Luther almost lost his life over that, right? And the church reformed because the gospel was attacked. Now I got a few other ones. I'm, you know, this is going to be on television because I'm going to be in big trouble. <laughs> Today, and maybe you haven't heard this, the theology of wealth. Have you heard that one? God wants you to be wealthy. If you do this, if you do that, God's will is for you to have all that you want and need. That's baloney. That, where did that come from? It sounds good, doesn't it? Man, that makes me happy. <laughs> Unless I don't have all that I want and need, then what's wrong with God? Or maybe it's me. See, we picked that up, and, and it's it, dumb ideas. The other one is this, and forgive me, pop psychology. Where you hear this wonderful good stuff of how you should be a nice person and do this. And that's true. But that's not the heart of Christianity, folks, right? The heart of Christianity is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and much of what is propagated, in my humble opinion, is all surface stuff. It's all surface stuff. And not the meat of the gospel and the law. Now the second application of this is, so you've got to guard against what you hear. And just because it's in a religious context doesn't mean it's true. Or in the Bible. Finally, obedience to God's will is important. It is important that you and I, as children of the Heavenly Father, that we strive to obey God's commands and His will. Amen? Amen. For several reasons. Number one, if you strive to follow God's will, life will what? Be better for you. You told your kids that. Johnny, if you listen to me, you'll be okay. <laughs> Did Johnny ever listen? I, 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 you listen. No, no, no parent ever sent their kids out on the railroad track to play. Right? Just listen to me. That's what God says to us. Just listen to me. Life will be better. Because God knows life. He knows what is good for us. We don't think he does. We want to do it our way. We know what's best for our way. You ever been through that in your life? Beating your head against the wall, doing stuff your way, and things didn't work out so well until you finally realized, I'm an idiot, and I got to change. Yeah, we go through that. Yes, sometimes too late. Okay? But it's important that you and I are, strive to be obedient to God's will because it, life will be better for us. Okay? Number two, it is important for us to do God's will and obey His commands because we become then witnesses of the Father in heaven. We live in a culture that wants very little to do with the commands of God. The Ten Commandments have gone out of the classroom. I, it would be a sin in America to put them in the classroom. We don't even want to talk about them. But the reality is, the world can do what they want, but you and I, we become witnesses of God's will, the Father's will, by how we are obedient. And, if, and, and I, was, I saw in a church, forgive me, and I don't know what this meant, but it says, we are a progressive Christian community. Now that doesn't sound bad, does it? But being skeptical, like I am, that may not be so good. Because we'll just, whatever. Whatever you want to do is good. And the reality is, the world is going to say you can do whatever. Lifestyle, what well, doesn't matter. But as God's people, we are witnesses of the Father. And we're going to take criticism for it. Amen? Amen. But we're witnesses, and we're going to suffer. Okay? So today, understand sin. If you have a shallow understanding of sin, pray for a deeper understanding. 
because when you have a real deep, a deeper understanding of sin, grace does become so much sweeter. In Jesus' name, amen.